All right, Ephesians chapter 1. Something I, I think about from time to time. I love that song we just sung also. But when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation. And I've seen the glory of the Lord through the eyes of faith. I'm not talking about seeing visions of the Lord. I'm talking about I've seen his glory in this book. And what I see darkly through a glass at times, guys, is so... So wonderful, man, that I don't, I don't even have the words to, 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 to offer to him. Amen. You know, that Bible talks about offering the, over Hosea chapter 14. It says, return unto the Lord your God. Then he says, take with you words. Say unto him, take away all our iniquity. Receive us graciously, and so will we render unto thee the calves of our lips. The calves of our lips. Right? Writer of Hebrews talks about that, offering unto God the, 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 the fruit of, of thanksgiving, praise unto God. Guys, if what I'm seeing through this book with the eyes of faith is any indication of what it's going to be like when we see him as he is face to face. Yeah. Amen. I mean, my goodness, man. You, I get chill bumps thinking about it. Yeah. I get, and... and I can't wait. I can't wait to walk up to him. It might. It might take. It might take. No, I'll get to see him at the judgment seat if, if he ever gets done with Gary. You know, we, we, Gary's going to take up a lot of time at the judgment seat. So. But in all, no, in all honesty, in all honesty, I can't wait for the day that I can look him face to face yeah. and tell him thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I mean, because it, it, he is wonderful. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Now, we already know this. But before you get to verse 15, Paul, of course, what, what comes before verse 15? Verses 1 through 14, right? <laughs> so, but in, in that section back there, we've looked at that, we looked at this for a couple of weeks, and and what Paul does in that, that opening section prior to getting to verse 15 is he he makes he makes the mystery, he makes known to us the mystery of God's will. If you look back there in verse uh, 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. I'm thankful to know that in a, amidst all the chaos in this world, there's a lot of chaos, a lot of vanity, a lot of nothing. Right? right? And I'm glad to know that in the midst of this chaos and this vanity and this, this world just headed towards a big fat nothing. That in the midst of that, there is a purpose. Yes, there is something that's been purposed for all of this. Right? And there, there's a wisdom operating today that's got the world headed towards nowhere and nothing. The course of this world, if you look there in Ephesians 2, verse 2, Paul says, Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Guys, I don't know what to tell you if that don't, if that don't change the way you view the world. Sure. Amen. I mean, there's not a whole lot I can do for you. The course of this world is, is according to the prince of the power of the air. And if you're walking according to this present time and this present world, the spirit that's working in you is a spirit of disobedience. Right? And so, and so what, I, what, I'm, what I want you to understand is that in the midst of all of it, there is an unseen purpose of God. Amen. That he already planned and purposed before he ever put it in motion in Genesis 1-1. Right? 
And, and Paul, Paul begins to talk to us about this because Paul wants us to no longer walk according to the course of this world, but he wants us to walk in accordance to the plan and purpose that God gave us in Christ before the world began. Amen. And there's two things you should be, or there's one thing you should be doing in light of what God has called us to, and, and Paul tells Timothy about it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we are to be exercising ourselves unto godliness. And I'm, we're not going to get into that this morning, but what I want you to understand right now is there is a purpose. You, you can go ahead and understand that the majority of the world is just going to come to nothing. It ends in death, destruction, chaos, vanity, nothing you did, nothing you you will do is going to amount to anything. Your college education, your career, your money, your bank accounts, your retirements, your boats, your, 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 your American dream, it all just, in a moment, Amen. out you go. And the poor man dies like the rich man and the wise man dies like the fool. One event befalleth them all. But there is, there is a wisdom ordained before the world unto our eternal glory. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad to know that there is a purpose. And what Paul tells us, if you look back in Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through what? His blood. The forgiveness of what? According to the riches of his grace, right? Now look at verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So out here, I have an inheritance. Out here in the future. Right there is past, future. Now where, where are you at in that? What are you, what are you doing to get that? You have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So how did you get the forgiveness of sins? Through the redemption that's in the blood of Christ. And now having been redeemed, you've also obtained an inheritance out here in the future. That thing's, that thing's as good as gold. Yes, sir. That thing's settled. Amen. Right? And then... So there's two events here, the redemption and the redemption of the purchased possession to where we go up here to receive our inheritance. That's past and future, but also you have a past and a present right now. All right? Your past. You know what your past is? Look at verse 13. I'm showing you the in whom's here. In whom we have redemption, in whom we've obtained an inheritance. Look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted. Only you, only you can answer that question. Yeah. Only you. People start, when they start trying to say, am I going to heaven? Am I going to heaven? Am I, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? Do you know what they start doing? Yeah. They start looking at everything they've done. That's right. Take an inventory yeah. of their life. And then they, when they start thinking about their life, they start thinking about, I mean, you got some people out there so deceived they don't even see their sin in their past, but if a man's honest, his conscience begins to condemn him. Right? Who are you trusting? Don't tell me about some religious experience you had. People, people trying to look back. Who are you trusting right now? You're either trusting him or you're not. That's right. Amen. Right now, I'm, well, listen, man, we understand people doubt. I've doubted. I've had moments of, of, of fear and, and doubt and, and trying to figure things out. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this. At some point in the past, you heard the gospel of your salvation, did you? And when you heard the gospel of your salvation, did you trust in him upon hearing that gospel of your salvation? Amen. So, 
In my past, I trusted Christ. Right? And now, presently, right here's that redemption, right here's the future. In the past, in my life, I trusted in Christ upon hearing the gospel. And after I believed, I was sealed. With that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That tells me when I get the inheritance. Mm -hmm. I have an earnest right now until the redemption of the purchased possession when I get that inheritance. But guess what? Guess what, guys? Simply because I heard and trusted the gospel, God has sealed me in his plan and purpose with his promise. Now here, here's the question. Weatherman tells you it's going to rain. Them jokers lie to you six days a week and you still take an umbrella out the house. <laughs> what do you got to doubt? Right. Why is it you can believe man and not him? Yeah. You ever think about it? Remember what John said? John said if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. You know why you all come to church this morning? Because y'all believed a liar, me, let God be true in every man of what? Y'all believed I was going to be here. And if y'all think I'm faithful enough to be here, that you come, and some of you drove a long distance to be here because you believed I was going to be behind that pulpit, why can't you believe him? Amen. Right? We are sealed with this promise of God. And so now what Paul does now, look at verse 15. He says, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Right, so Paul, upon hearing of their faith, and he does this again in Colossians. He, he, Paul never met the Colossian believers. They had never seen him in the flesh. But Paul, Paul had this same prayer for the Colossian believers. And so how many of y'all believe that, that, all right, Paul heard that these Ephesians, he had heard of their faith in Christ, their love unto all the saints, and this is his prayer. How many of y'all think that makes this prayer important about your Christian life? That this should be the focus of your Christian life after believing the gospel. Right? Now how many of you think if it's important that it should be talked about in church? Now how many of you think the clown's not talking about just playing games? So what was Paul's prayer for us? Paul's prayer is for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you can know some things, right? If you don't know them, if you don't know them, then this prayer is unfulfilled in your life, right? Now you say, why is it important for us to know this stuff? What is it Paul's wanting us to know? Well, Paul, Paul's wanting you as a, as a believer now that's now believed and are now sealed unto this eternal purpose of God. Paul, as you believe as a believer, right now Paul wants you to know some things in relationship to this purpose of God. Right? Were you called? Did God call you? Well, Paul wants you to know the hope of that. Right? Do you have an inheritance? Paul wants you to know the riches of the glory of it. And then he adds one. He says, he says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? And we're, 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 going, we're going to get into these things over the next couple of weeks. But just right now, I want you to understand why this is important. Come to Ephesians chapter 4. The reason your spiritual understanding of this stuff is so important is look at chapter 4 verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Right? I mean, I don't know everybody. I know Brother, Brother Tim worked for the NSA, right? 
for years. Stephen works at, uh, what is the name of that place down there in Clarksburg? Yeah. You're a, you a dentist, brother? Yes. Conrad's an engineer, right? Now, can any one of y'all perform your vocation in ignorance? Man goes in and says he's a dentist and don't even know how many teeth are in a man's head. You know that? Would you trust a man like that to work on your mouth? I wouldn't. But what I want you to understand is the walk worthy of the vocation concludes the doctrinal instruction in the first three chapters. The spiritual understanding Paul wants you to come to in Ephesians 1 is necessary for you to walk the way you're supposed to walk in this calling. Walking worthy of it means you're not earning it. Walking worthy means you're walking compatible, equal to, in compliance to the calling. When we say a man and woman, oh, they're worthy of each other, right? You're worthy of that man, or that man's worthy of you. You're not talking about somebody earning this, the, this calling. You're talking about how you walk in compliance to this calling. And the only way you can walk worthy of the vocation that we've been called with is to, be, is to have the eyes of your understanding enlightened to be able to understand it. Right? Because look at what he says in Ephesians 4.17 now. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth, where, where are you at? Right? You've now trusted in Christ, been sealed in Christ unto this, and Paul says, from this point on, don't you walk as other Gentiles walk. Right? But look at what he says there. In the vanity of their what? So how does the Gentile walk, world walk? The mind is in vanity. You say, what, what, is, what is the vanity of the mind? Now guys, it's a, it's a million and one things. It could be anything. Amen? Politicians, it could be philosophers, it could be preachers. It could be religious men, monks, it can be. But what I, what I want you to understand is, is any mind that's void of the knowledge of Ephesians 1 is in vanity. Every mind that doesn't understand the will and purpose that God purposed in his son before the foundation of the world is a mind that's in vanity. Yes, Nothing he's doing is, is toward the eternal purpose of the creator. It's toward death and nothingness. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Doesn't matter what you think or believe. Ignorance of what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 1 leaves you in the vanity of your mind. Amen. Amen. So what happens to the mind that's in vanity? Well, because of the vanity of the mind, right, they have a having the understanding. Understanding what? Darkened. Boy, what an awful, terrible condition to be in. Inner darkness. People can't find their way, you know. Remember when Christ said, He that followeth me shall not, shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Right? You see this, this vanity of the mind gives a darkened understanding. Meaning, what meaning does your life have? What is the purpose of your steps? What is the purpose of your choices and your decisions? Are you laboring and preparing things for death? Something that baffles me is, is a person dies and leaves a great estate and the family fights over it. Did you really not learn at death that it's not worth fighting over? The man died and left it for you to fight about. Why are you fighting it so you can, you can just leave it behind too? I don't understand man's mentality. You don't need a Bible to know that this is vanity out here. Solomon didn't have the Word of God when he wrote the book of vanity. 
Solomon searched everything under the sun and concluded it's all vanity. You don't need a book to understand that. Just look at the world around you. But because people have this vanity in their mind, the understanding is darkened. What does that darkened understanding do? That darkened understanding alienates. This right here, this vain mind and this darkened understanding alienates us from the life of God through the ignorance. There's an ignorance in us. People get so offended at words like that. Don't you dare, don't you dare tell me I'm not allowed to use holy words. Because when you start thinking you're more holy than that book, you've gotten too big for your britches. And if you don't like God calling you ignorant, deal with it. Right there's the Gentile world. A vain mind with a darkened understanding alienated from God's life through ignorance. And why is this ignorance rolling in them? Because of the blindness of their heart. The blindness of their heart. You see that? The heart is not, the heart is blind because the darkened understanding. We talked about this last week. The only way you can cure the blindness of your heart and remove that ignorance that alienates you from the life of God is for this vanity of your mind to be removed and you get the eyes of your understanding enlightened. That gives sight to the heart and then Christ indwells our heart by faith. That's where the life of God comes from. So, do you see now, do you see the reversal of what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 1 when he says that God would give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The walk that you are now to live, right now, Looking towards this stuff out here, the life God wants you to live and walk right now can only, you can only walk like that when you receive the enlightened understanding. Amen. Right? Y'all got it? I hope you do. You'll, be, you'll go home and be like, I didn't. What does he mean, the mind and the heart, mind and the heart? Man, the longer I'm at this, the more I have no problem seeing my mind and my heart. Amen? But, but listen, look, look, look here in Ephesians 1 real quick. Ephesians chapter 1. That God would give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of what? Him. Ephesians 1, 17. So step one. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Knowledge of Him. What do you know? What do you know? See, we're going, we're going to take inventory this morning. We're going to, I mean, I, I don't know you. I don't know what you know. You know what you know. Do you know him or don't you? Do you have enough knowledge of him that you can wake up and know how he wants you to walk? Right? How many of, I, mean, I mean, I had a dad, man. I had a father. I knew my father. I knew that man more than any man probably I've ever been on this earth. Listen, guys, you know what Paul, the, the, the first step to this, this is where I'm heading with this. The first step in this is the knowledge of him. If you have no desire or interest to take in the knowledge of God, there's no point to any of it. Right? Because the spirit of wisdom and revelation is in this knowledge here. The knowledge of God. Look at look at look at look down there at verse uh, 18. This is the listen, guys, this is the only thing that's going to cure this. The only thing that's going to get rid of that vanity of the mind. That right there. Because look at what he says in verse 18. 
What is the hope of whose calling? So whose calling is it? God's, right? The riches of the glory of what? His inheritance. And the exceeding greatness of whose power? His power. Which who wrought? In Christ. You see, there's three things Paul's wanting us this knowledge of God about his calling, his inheritance, and his power. These are the three things that Paul's dealing with here. But he wants you. He wants you to have a, a, an enlightened understanding so that you could know not just his calling, his inheritance, and his power. But there's things he wants you to understand about it. The hope of his calling. The riches of the glory. And the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. And it's only going to come through a spiritual understanding of this knowledge that knowledge has been given it's in your bible and i'm telling you you got to take it in and you got to take it in multiple times i read it, i've read ephesians 20 times with a darkened understanding i've read ephesians 3 with a darkened understanding you know how many times i've read that he According to the riches of his glory, would strengthen you by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your. How many times I've read through there, and by the time I got done, it felt like I got anything. I've stared at them verses. You say, why would you do that? Because it concludes with being filled with all the fullness of God. Don't you want that? And a power working in you that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Yeah, I'm going to stare at them. But for years I stared at them and didn't understand them. But you keep taking in the knowledge. You keep taking these things in and meditating upon them. And before you know it, that darkened understanding goes away. And the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. Then guess what you get access to over here? The removal of that ignorance gives you access to the life of God through the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, how many of you think the prayer is important? How many of you think the knowledge is important? Because it is. So this knowledge of Him, the knowledge of Him, knowledge of Him, that's the knowledge God Wants you to be focused on. Everything else is in vanity. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The knowledge of him. I want to teach you something about the knowledge of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You know what that means? The more you learn this wisdom of God, the more the world ain't going to understand what you're talking about. The more I increase in the knowledge of God, the more there's a, there's a barrier between me and the world. It's called light and darkness. God separated the light from the darkness. Where this light dwells, darkness, there's a barrier. I can no longer fellowship with darkness. I've got, I've got flesh and blood family, Bill, that when, when, I, when, I, when I meet them, I'm like, well, how you been? Good, how about you? Good. What do you want to talk about? They can't, they can't fellowship. Yeah, yeah. The light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. You following that stuff? And so, and so this knowledge... Paul, Paul says, Paul said, we speak it in a mystery. Look at what he says in verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, 
For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know what they did? They acted in ignorance. And you know what? You, you keep trying to operate. You keep thinking it's okay for you to operate in ignorance of this wisdom ordained before the world unto your glory. And you know what? Those same religious men who thought they were so holy that when God in flesh showed up, they nailed him to a cross and the princes of this world and all of creation acting in ignorance nailed God's son to a cross. You keep trying to function outside of the wisdom of God and you're an enemy of God whether you mean to be or not. I ain't man, listen. Look at what he says. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath what? Revealed them unto us by what? His spirit. Well, it'd be wonderful to know how you get that. Isn't that what Paul's talking about? A spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him? Wouldn't it be wonder to find out how you get this spirit, this, this spirit of God that reveals? Look at what the spirit of God does. He searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. <laughs> Y'all know where God's spirit is? You know where you're going to find the spirit of God searching the deep things of God? Right there. If you want revelation from God's spirit, you don't, he's, guys, he ain't your genie. Get the superstition out of your head. God reveals these things to us by his spirit right here. Because you know what you have access to right here? You have access to the deep things of God. Yes, sir. And right here is where the deep things of God are searched. Right here is where the Spirit of God reveals these things unto us. But look at what he says in verse 11. And here's, here's what you need to get. This knowledge of him right here. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth, knoweth no man. But the spirit of who? You know where you're going to get that knowledge of him? That's where it starts. That knowledge of him can only be learned by God's spirit. Man don't have it in him. Not by nature. Amen. That's why, just know, man, I know this stuff. And so when I, when I hear somebody, when I hear somebody trying to tell me about God, <laughs> and they're not telling me what that book says, in one ear and out the other with me. I don't take you serious. I really don't. Because I know that I have not seen, ear have not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. There's not a natural man on this earth that's ever stumbled around and stumbled upon the knowledge of God. Man has sent telescopes up. They've been to the deepest parts of the earth. Hey man, they've been in submarines, they've dug down miles, they've got telescopes up there, they blasted up rockets everywhere. If you believe all that stuff. Hey man. We got magnifying glasses, man, and microscopes, and we can get down and we see all these. Man has searched, man has searched the very depths and heights of heaven and earth. You know what he's never found? The knowledge of God. Amen? You, you ain't going to kid me. I hasn't seen it. There's only one place where this knowledge comes from, and it's the spirit of revelation. Right? God reveals himself in his word. So the second part now, the second part, this knowledge of him is God wants you to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. In this knowledge. Now, somebody, somebody, if y'all stay in 1 Corinthians, but I want somebody to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, and tell me, tell me if the Spirit there has a capital S or a little s. 
small s. All right, I'll come back to 1 Corinthians 2. Does that spirit in verse 11, capital or small s? Capital. Well, what about the spirit in verse 12? Capital or little? There you go. See how that Bible is. Right there is the capital S spirit of God right there. That little s spirit is your spirit. What Paul's prayer is, is that your spirit would be a spirit of wisdom and revelation in this knowledge. What he's talking about is you having a spirit in you that's been taught and instructed by the spirit of God. Yes, sir. Amen? Yeah. Y'all follow that. Look at, look, look at Job 32. Somebody get Job 32. Y'all don't, y'all don't have to flip there, man. I'll just quote it to you. We save some time here. Job 32 and 8. There is a spirit in man. You know what that is? That's a young man talking. His name's Elihu. And he's sitting listening to, to Job and Eliphaz and, and these guys. He's sitting listening to these guys talk now. And finally in chapter 32, you know, he said, he said, I sat back and I kept my mouth shut. He said, because I thought to myself, days should speak and multitude of years should, should utter wisdom or something to that effect. He said, I, I gave respect to you men because you're old. And I figured that you had learned things in all your days and years. But then he says, but there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Old men are not always wise. That's what he says. So there is a spirit in man. And how does God give understanding to man? The inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Now, if you, you, you keep up with this, man, it's going to help you. So I have a spirit in me. And the way God gives me understanding is through the insp his inspiration in me. Now, the word inspiration is only in your Bible one other time. And it's all scripture was given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. So you know what that book was given for? There's the inspiration of the Almighty. And I know this book was given and is specifically given to give me understanding spiritually, under spiritual understanding. This book was made for my spirit. Do you understand that? I have something in me, Bill. You, uh, most of us are, man, we look in mirrors and we're so, we're, so, we're so tended towards the flesh and the physical world. But there's a spirit in you. There's a spirit in you. And this book was given specific for that spirit. This book was made to fit in your spirit like a hand in a glove. And it's through that book that God animates us with his life. And we are to, when, when Paul talks about this spirit of wisdom and revelation, he's talking about a man, a man in his inner man, in his Spiritual man, that's, he now has this wisdom and revelation in this knowledge of God being taught to him by God's Spirit. Look back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again. No man knoweth the things of God, save the Spirit of God that is in him. Now, Paul says, now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. He ain't talking, now get this, all the little baby Christians out there don't know how to read a Bible, don't know how to study a Bible. That offends you, get offended. That, that verse is not talking about you getting the Holy Spirit when you got saved. You know what? The majority of, there's a lot of people that have believed, there are a lot of people that are right here. They've trusted, they're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, but guess what? The spirit that is in them is still the spirit of this world. 
They have no knowledge outside of what they're hearing with their eyes and their ears in the world. Bring up COVID. Watch them. Bring it up. Bring up the Ukrainian war. Bring up China. Bring up trade. Bring up the economy. You know what I'm sick of in America? I'm sick of every election, a bunch of obese people with money in the bank account. Number one, number one issue in America is the economy. Really? That's your number one issue in America is the economy. Inflation, price of gas. Because I can think of about 100,000 things that trump in America what's going on with the economy. Amen? You know what the number one issue in America is for me? Biblical ignorance. Amen? Amen. Children, children being told they come from monkeys instead of being told Jesus Christ died and shed his blood for their sins. That, 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 this, is, this, is, this is the issue today. Right? But this spiritual, this spiritual maturity in us when we talk about this spirit of wisdom, Paul says, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. What Paul means here is that spirit which is of God is a spirit in man that's been educated and taught by the spirit of God to know this knowledge of God here. And most people that are a lot, yeah, most people that are saved are operating under the spirit of this world. And so Paul goes on to say, now he says which things. Now you know how this, you know how this spirit, the spirit which is of God in here, the spirit of God in us that's been taught by the word of God, you know where that, you know where that spirit is manifested? You know how you know when a man's got it? Verse 13. Which things also we what? It's manifested in a speech. John told you that too. I'll quote First John. I know it's dispensational application, but you know what John said? He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit. For he, he, said, he says, For many, he says, But try the spirits whether they be of God. For many false prophets are gone out into the world. And then you know how he tells you how to tell them, how to discern them? He says, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world. And the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He, he listen, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Amen. He's telling you how to discern between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of error speaks of the world. And people in error... Listen and follow them. Them that are of God speak the things of God and those that are in the truth hear and understand them. Yeah. Amen. Guys, I give you good doctrine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. The spirit of wisdom. Spirit. Paul says, Paul says that we, this knowledge, now that we have this spirit of, 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 of knowing these things that are freely given to us of God, Paul says that we speak these things. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. A spiritual man has a Holy Ghost vocabulary. <laughs> Amen. And, and a lot of the times people come to church and when a, man's, when a man's got this spirit, he starts using words that people never heard in their everyday vocabulary. Amen. The eternal purpose of God, which is in Christ, which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Y'all, I mean, that's in your dialect, right? But it's not a glossa, you understand. It's in English. But Paul, we're speaking with a vocabulary that's been taught to us by the Spirit of God to understand this wisdom. And he says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, 
Yet he himself is judged of no man. Why? For who hath known the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him. But what do we have? What does this man have? He has the mind of Christ. You know, you know if you have the mind of Christ, you know what that makes you. Now you're already a son in your position. But if you have the mind of Christ, you're a son in your education. You wake up every morning knowing the will of the Father like Christ knows the will of the Father. And when you, when that knowledge, this is what Paul's going to talk about in Ephesians 3. Remember Paul in Romans 8 and Galatians 4, he talks about the Spirit of God's Son being sent into your hearts crying out of a Father. The only way that Spirit can make it to the heart is through you having the mind of Christ in the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. When you get the mind of Christ and that understanding is enlightened, that heart begins to cry out, Abba, Father. Because now you're not just a son in your position in Christ. You're a son in your education and in your walk. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Amen. No longer walking in the vanity of their mind. But thou they're walking, understanding the will of the Lord, and walking in accordance to this eternal purpose which God gave us in Christ before the world began. That's a son. Amen. Look at uh, last, last, last part right here. Look at back at Ephesians chapter 2 or chapter 1. I always mean to get deeper than this, guys, or farther, not deeper. I know we probably got deeper than most of you'd care for, but I always intend to get further. But I, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's stuff, I think if you go home, if you walk out them doors and you take this stuff to heart, it's going to help you. Now, what, you know what's going to happen and why a lot of you ain't going to pay the cost? Is because when you start walking like that, it's going to bring loss. It's going to bring, it's going to bring suffering. Amen. The course of this world is an easy course to walk in. Right? It makes your present tolerable. But it all ends in vanity and death. But the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. And that's why a lot of people ain't going to pay the cost to walk the life. Mm. That's right. Because his life functioning in you now brings sufferings with him. You suffer with him presently if you're walking with him and in him. The eyes of, and, and listen, you can go to heaven without any of that. Just know that if you deny him, he's going to deny you. Yeah. Amen? But if you suffer, you shall reign. Look, look at Ephesians 1, 18. Last part there. The last part of your, your curing. We've already wrote it up here. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. This perception This perception right here. You see, the vanity of the mind is taken care of by the knowledge here. And when we, re when we receive this spirit, this, this inspiration of God giving us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in this knowledge, this cures our darkened understanding. The understanding is no longer darkened, but the eyes of our understanding are enlightened. Now, if you've, been, if, you've, if you've been at this any amount of time, y'all know that experience. Y'all know it. I've been at it, man, Bill. There's been times I've been down in that study. It's real. It's literally like somebody taking a 10 million candlelight flashlight and shining it down in the deepest parts of your inner man. That's what it's like. And I, I've, been, I've been in that Bible 20 years where the Where the most part, most, most of the time, man, it was just darkness. I felt like I was wandering around in a wilderness for a long time. And you know what I've come to understand about the Bible, guys? Is when you're not getting light from that Bible, there's something in your mind blocking that light. 
usually unbelief, something that needs corrected. And so you got to stay faithful to the book. Keep reading the book and eventually God is going to correct something in your mind. The hardest part of learning the Bible is the unlearning phase. That's the hardest part is the corrective phase. When God gets, when the word of God starts going in there, you know what he's doing? He's casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And if you're a person that doesn't take well to correction, you're not going to be a person that's ever going to get your understanding enlightened. Because that light cannot penetrate the strongholds that's already in your mind. That's what's blinding you. The God of this world. And when those strongholds get ripped down by God, when you finally start, when you finally got enough humility to fall on your face and say, God, I'm tired of being ignorant. This old poor, this poor man cried upon the Lord and he saved him from all of his troubles. God, I'm tired of being stupid. I'm tired of being ignorant. I'm tired of being wrong. I'm tired of not knowing how to raise my kids. I'm tired of not knowing how to be a husband. I'm tired, tired, tired. When you get to that point and you start letting God correct that mind and, and eventually, man, when he gets that mind finally cleansed of all the garbage, his light comes in and it you go from feeling like you ain't going nowhere 10, 15 years and all of a sudden God gets that mind to the point where it just accelerates. You just start growing, increasing every day. I've learned more up here in four years pastoring this church than I did in the first 26 years of my Christian or 26, 16 years of my Christian life serving God. Amen. Y'all, 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 y'all understand what I'm saying. You let God correct you, the instruction is the easy part. The hardest part is unlearning all the garbage you've learned from the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world and that spirit which is of God are contrary one to the other. And if you're still trying to cling to parts of this world, and, and it's not going to happen. The word of God goes contrary to that stuff. The carnal mind is enmity against him. Right? And so when you, when you get this, Colossians chapter 1, well, look at Ephesians 3 on your way. Last two verses, I promise this. I mean, not last two verses, last two references. Because we're going we're gonna to read like two verses here in Ephesians. But let, let, look, look here at Ephesians 3, 17. Don't you want this right here? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. The indwelling of God's Son. <laughs> Christ in you. The indwelling of God's Son in your heart. If He takes over the heart, He's got you. Amen, your motives change, your, your, your desires change, your purpose for getting up in the morning changes. Your bit, you, no, no more bitterness. Christ's not bitter. Mm -hmm. Right? I can deal with things now, Bill, that I couldn't have dealt with 15 years ago. There's a wisdom and a love and a, and a righteousness peace. that is a peace, all, all of it that is now operating in me. Because of Christ dwelling in my heart by faith, by simple faith. Look at, look at what he says. he says. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the depth and breadth and length and uh, how, how does he say it? Length, length, breadth, depth and height. And to know the love of Christ that passeth what? Full comprehension is what God wants you to have. God wants you to comprehend, not just me. He wants you to comprehend with all saints. He wants all saints to comprehend the four dimensions of this fullness of Christ. And to know his love that passes knowledge. You ever thought about that? 
God doesn't just want you down here knowing some knowledge. He wants you to know the love of Christ that passes that knowledge. There's a stage out there beyond knowledge. Heaven and earth passeth away, but my word. He's talking about when he says that passeth knowledge, there's a stage that you're going to come to that's going to pass knowledge to where the love of Christ is absolutely, absolutely fully operational in your inner man. And when you get to that point, Paul says that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. Now do you know how Paul could live the way he lived? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Right? Look, look, look. Come to Colossians 1. Because Paul, Paul, in Colossians 1, Paul is going to sum up everything I just taught this morning in two verses. Y'all probably like to have him as a pastor, wouldn't you? <laughs> if he could say everything that I just said in two verses, man. Because look at what he says in Colossians 1.9. That's his prayer for the Colossians, his desire for the Colossians, his prayer and desire for them is that they might be filled with all the what? Knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's what we just talked about this morning. The knowledge of God's will. In spiritual, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might what? That you might what? Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You see the importance of this edification and this education here? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding so that you can walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Amen. We got a lot of people that have a heart for God. They want to they want to please God. We got a lot of people out here trying to do things for the Lord. But what I'm telling you is a lot of them are trying to do things in ignorance of the Lord. Yeah. I don't question their motives or their desire or their heart. They're just operating in ignorance. Right? The eyes of your understanding being, in the, he, says, he says, spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And here's what I was talking about. And increasing in the knowledge of who? God. You started out here with not the knowledge of his will. But now Paul's talking about increasing in the knowledge of God. And that's, that's what I was talking about just a second ago. You're going to get to a point in your Christian life where through this the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You're going to come to a point in your Christian life where through that enlightened understanding, you're going to just keep increasing in the knowledge of God. You're not, there's not going to be any stagnation. Let's argue about repentance again. We ain't argued about that one in five months. Let's get on Facebook and have the old, let's rehash the old repentance debate. Y'all ready? The theological debates people have. Y'all ready to y'all ready to fist fight over baptism again? Let's do it, guys. Right? You're not going to stay there stagnant and then trying to comfort yourself by proving that your view of repentance is better than everybody else's. You're going to get to a point, man, where you just start increasing. In the knowledge of God. And that's that new creature. The more you know him, the newer you are. Amen. Transformed through the renewing of the mind. And I love it, man. I love it. Because the more I increase in his knowledge, the more this old man is forever gone. And I mean it. Forever gone. I'm not trying to get him back up from the ground. Leave him dead and buried, boys. Leave him dead and buried. Because the new man that God is transforming me to be lives throughout all ages. World without end. Amen.
And those age, ages are, are to operate in this wisdom right here, not in the current wisdom of this world. So unlearn it. Unlearn it. Take on the wisdom of God. Any questions on this? Next week we'll get into these three things right here. Right? What they are, that's the knowledge. But the eyes of your understanding is so that you can know the hope of this, the riches of the glory of this, and the exceeding greatness of this right here. He wants you to fully understand those three things. Not just know about them, but to fully comprehend and understand them. All right, let's pray. Father, God, once again, we just thank you for those that come out. Lord, I pray if there be any here, Lord, that doesn't know you as their Savior, that today would be the day that they simply just trust that your son died for them on a cross to, to forgive them of all their sins and to justify them unto eternal life, Lord, to, to give them a pardon from the condemnation of death and to be freely justified unto eternal life. God, we pray for those that are justified and have believed the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you would tug at their hearts, Lord, through, through the message this morning. We pray, God, that you would uh, give them a hunger and a desire in themselves to know this will and to walk worthy of it. God, and we just pray for this church. We pray, God, that we'd be a light in this community. We pray, God, that if we step outside the doors and walk in the streets, Father, that we'd live in a way that's pleasing to you and, and that the world can see the gospel of your Son in us. And God, we just pray that as people travel home now, we, we pray, God, that you'd look after them, Lord, bring them back to us safely at the next appointed time. And we just ask it all in the holy and precious name of our Savior. Amen.